action. Hey, today's class is like one of my favorites. Um, regardless, you will have changed once you hear today's lecture. Whether it's for the better or for the worse, I don't know. Uh, we all change. It's it's constant, right? And three, you will be three hours or two hours along. Anyway, I wanted to talk about this. I feel like this topic of test scores and why we do SEM in the first place is really a big deal. So I put it here. I was building a lecture. The lecture finally got done last night. And of course, the lecture is too long and it's only half of the, the story. Really? What? The lecture failed to converge. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, maybe some of you can empathize, you know, know how that feels when things fail to converge. Yeah, I tried to change the iteration number and everything, and, and sure enough, no, I, um, I just, I really got into it because I feel very passionately about this topic, test scores of all things. So we're going to talk about test scores today. And we talked the last time, two weeks ago, I said, when you leave, remember, most of us have taken a, a, a test or taken a survey or taken data from tests and surveys, added the items together and used them. Right? What's the problem with that? What goes on with that? Or better yet, how does that jive with SEM? Why do we have SEM in the first place? So my goal today is to talk about what scores are, their psychometric properties, and how they relate to SEM. And then also kind of what the problems with scores are. Uh, and there's different types. There are some scores or test scores or whatever you want to call them. Anybody else have any of the label for test score or some score? Total score? Total score. That's good. Total. I'll put that down. Anybody else? If, it, if you're like me in school, you, you put some type of expletive. No, sorry. Sorry, no, I can't do that. Anyway, um, yeah, Qbert language, right? Remember Qbert? Anybody know what that reference? We never, uh, so there was a video game back in the 80s, long time ago, and it was this, you know, like all 8-bit video games. It was a thing that you could play with a, like a joystick because that's all we could do, right? And it would, it was this bouncing, stupid-looking thing on a two-dimensional, tricked-out perspective triangle, right? And then it would get angry sometimes when it died somehow, and it would have like expletives, a thought bubble, right? Anyway, never mind. That, that a good dot, a proof? Nobody knows Qbert? I, I assumed you were referencing Atari. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. We're, we're just going to, uh, we're just going to keep going. Keep going here. It was a good try. Yeah, I try. I'm trying. I don't bring it up. Anyway, test scores, some scores, total scores. But also, kind of the, uh, as I got into this, I'm thinking, okay, so, yeah, there's test scores, but then test scores aren't really what, what you get all the time. Like, what is your GRE then? Right? Is your GRE a sum of the items you got right? No. That's something different. It's a factor score. Well, we call it th different terms. Theta, ability, whatever. But they're still the same type of topic. Um... So let's talk about those, what they are, what they contain, what they mean psychometrically, and how they relate to what we're doing in class. Uh, I'm going to stay on the CFA or SEM side of things, and I want to convince you today that when you sum together items, you're actually implying a very specific type of measurement model in CFA. And I can show you this because I can make a factor score and a sum score correlate perfectly. Right? 100% correlate perfectly between the two. So you go with that. That's toward the end of the, the lecture, all right? So when, it, when you take a sum score, you've been doing CFA the whole time, believe it or not. But anyway, uh, we're also going to talk about score reliability. And then I'm going to talk today about why using scores alone in a separate analysis is uh, not really good practice, even though it's always done. <coughs> I start to choke on that. It seems like the... Uh, the gods of social science are telling me to shut it, Templin. <laughs> shut it. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, unfortunately the reason for what I'm going to describe here. What a score contains isn't necessarily good stuff. It's kind of like a. How many of you eat hot dogs? Yeah. How many of you eat hot dogs from the Royals games? <laughs> if you go Google Royals hot dogs, <laughs> the first image you pull up. Here, I'll help you. 
Oh gosh. <laughs> I had a Chicago dog recently. Can I the Royals hot dog lawsuit is what comes up. <laughs> Incident. There you go. Royals are serving fans moldy garbage hot dogs. Look at that. That's a hot dog at a Royals game right there. Anyway, there's what goes in. What's in a hot dog? I don't want to know, right? But we're gonna be we're gonna be telling you like the the we're gonna make the the equivalent that a test score and a factor score for that matter, on their own are hot dogs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like if you're like me, I like to grill hot dogs. I don't know about you. Like the two there are two of you admit hot eating hot dogs. It's awesome. Thank you both. Um, do you ever like I like them on a grill, uh, but I like to like kind of cut them in a circle so like like a ribbon. You get they grill on more sizes. I don't know if you've seen that before, but um, twisted hot dog. Hey, you guys, look at me. Anyway, Google that. You'll find it. But um, in that case, you really want to get a high quality hot dog, right? <laughs> if you can believe such things. So you go to the store and you look at hot dogs, and there's like different types, right? There's like the all beef, and there's a, but they're still just hot dogs, right? <laughs> Do they eat hot dogs in other countries? Those of you from other countries? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Barbecue hot dog. Okay, so so this is not just America and yeah, right. Um, anyway, okay, so big picture. Um, the purpose of this class and the main message of structural equation models. Now you may think it's estimation or matrix algebra or RMSEA or CFA or something like that, but the big picture is that um, multivariate analyses with and without measurement error, when done simultaneously, give you more accurate results. That's the big picture, right? It's all about multivariate analyses done simultaneously. And the reason for that is the error that you find in each step of analysis, an, an analysis will propagate, right? You'll take, if you take some results with error from one analysis and take it and put it in another analysis, you've, and you forget about the error, then you're more prone to make more mistakes that are bigger and larger the more times you use it. So that's the big picture of the class. I mean, we sometimes lose it given all the, have, the details we have to get across. Saturated models and all these technical jargon and output and everything. But that's it. Simultaneous analyses are awesome. But let's be real. How many of you can do a simultaneous analysis? Right? It rarely is the case where you've collected enough data uh, better yet, you've given out 15 different surveys, and now you want to put every item from 15 surveys into one analysis. How many data points do you have to collect to do that, right? So I'm trying to build this lecture, and then next week is going to try to build, next week's kind of the solution. I'm trying to solution, if you will, my take on the solution. Um, I'm trying to build that to you to get you as close to results from a simultaneous analysis, even if you can't do the simultaneous analysis. Because a lot of times we just can't. Yes, Devane. At the risk of sounding foolish, what's the difference then between doing analyses simultaneously, or rather as close as possible, since you can't do them simultaneously, mm -hmm. and using post hoc analyses? Uh, the difference is in the technique. right? So the, what we're going to end up doing in terms of simultaneous analysis is um, we're going to have to treat the score itself as a piece of missing data that may or may not have sample size issues that go into it. And so where in a regular post hoc analysis, you just take the score and plug it into, let's say, ANOVA, see if there's a group difference between factors. Um, for us, we need to recognize that that score, because it has error to it, we've got to put the error back into that post, -error, post hoc analysis. So it's going to be a post hoc analysis, but it's with the best chance we have to maintain the score as the property of the score itself rather than just a number, right? It's like, uh, I think the, bo the boiling this down to, remember that clip from the matrix I showed you, there is no spoon, right? There is no score, just if you can, it's hard to believe because everybody has a score. We score all the time, right? But some of you have a score to settle, right? <laughs> it's, it's tough, but, um, the reality of it is in psychometrics, if we start to go down the psychometric pathway and start assuming certain things, then really we don't have a score. We have our best guess as to what somebody's score should be. We're after a true score or we're after a factor or something along those lines. Does that answer any question? Wait. And I asked you to be skeptical about this, so please be skeptical. Look at me and be like, come on, Templin. 
hashtag tweet me with the hashtag WF Templin, WTF Templin. Megan will be thankful because her picture will go off of the. She just needs two more tweets to get it away. <laughs> And then I'll make the length of the tweet show up, like make it go 15 deep. Nah, never mind. Anyway. Yeah, so what's in a sum score? What's in a hot dog? <laughs> uh, okay, so as I've been a student and a teacher, I found the topic of test scores to be incomplete and often contradictory. I mean this. It's tough. Like... Um, so here are some th things that I've heard in my experience teaching studenting I put student that's where I, that's the research side of me I'm still a student student of like life of science of the ball game here right you know the, the ball game of life anyway here's what I've heard corroborate uh, raise your hand if you if you heard this before adding things up some scores are almost always okay you just add them up it's okay I've heard this nobody else yeah thank you I should Factor scores, like your GRE, are okay if they're from some strange sounding model. Like the GRE, it's a computerized adaptive test that uses IRT. So they're okay. Yeah, you heard that? Clearly. Better yet, some scores, you can't use a, fa and then finally, factor scores themselves, just factor scores, you put factor score up there, that's the work of the devil, right? So simultaneously, I've had people, in, particularly in psychology, I'm not trying to rip on my colleagues in psych. I'm using this as a um, kind of a learning experience, right? We're, we're, we're taught certain things, but then we get out in the research world and it's like it doesn't come true. But I've had colleagues, you know, say, well, you'll you can't publish factor scores because we, everybody knows factor scores are indeterminate, right? You can't publish on them. And then they turn around. They're telling you that on the way to an admissions meeting where they look at a GRE score and they admit people on it, which is a factor score, right? And so it's like, I don't want, uh, there's a disconnect somewhere, and I want to be, try to help solve that disconnect. This is, this is it. I'm really passionate about this, right? So uh, here's the question I keep hearing is, why use structural equation modeling or CFA or IRT or some other measurement model when I can just use the sum of the items, right? So some of the items, uh, I, I kind of am using R syntax here, uh, is a sum score, a total, total score, I got total, or the add stuff up model the ASU model. Um, and I, I like to put this here because, believe it or not, when you add stuff up, and I'm going to try to make the case to you today, that is a model. You're doing a model there. Right? I used to make a joke when I, when I, when I talk to audiences that aren't psychometrically bent, you know, that aren't in grad school like you are or that aren't in the field. I try to, they're like, what is a psychometrician? I'm kind of like, well, you know, we sort of provide scores on tests. And then I would say something along the lines of, have you ever, driving somewhere, been cut off and said, you idiot, to somebody? And I say, you are a psychometrician. You've just scored a test of driving and pronounced somebody's mental status based on one item, right? So anyway, um, again, that is the way we look at it. It's everything is a model. Everything you do has a statistical property to it. Uh, we just don't, haven't done a good job getting all those details out. So anyway. So some scores are used as uh, observed variables in secondary analyses, right? That's really the context in this class we talk about them, but they're also used to give results to people, participants, students, subjects, uh, patients. I, uh, I gave a workshop on item response theory with one little Willie Skrupski. Sorry, I, I saw a website that Never mind. Re tricks out your own website's language, and I put Billy's faculty page in, and they called him Little Willie. <laughs> anyway, I'll. I'll I haven't yet. I'm about to, though. Yeah, so uh, Billy Skrupski. Anyway, he and I taught a workshop on item response theory, an another measurement model, uh, a long time ago in, in Philadelphia to a, a testing organization, American Board of Internal Medicine, that grants licensure exams for different types of doctors and surgeons and so forth, and they use scores to go adding things up to go and license people. How about that? I've had surgery. Maybe you've had surgery before. Would you like to know if the sum score that the surgeon had was sufficient? They added things up. That sounds great. Anyway, uh, so here is, I'm going to try to do the best job I could to describe research using psychometrics in educational and psychological research. I would, those are the two areas I know best. I probably could expand this to more areas. I've heard a lot about political science. I hear that's probably true there too. 
But, um, so, we use a sum score in our analysis until some reviewer, remember reviewer three? <laughs> Uh, says you can't use one. Hey, you can't use a score. So then what you do is you go back to your data, you run a CFA model to show that there's one factor, and then you use a sum score. All right? Does that sound about right? Yeah, maybe? Yes? No? And then I'm not trying to, uh, and again, I'm not trying to pick on people. What I'm trying to do is take the position of, sorry, there will be people I pick on here, and it's not the researchers are doing this. You know, we're, I'm trying to do a better job training so we can try to make this a little bit more understandable. Uh, the people I'm going to pick on are the people who are in the testing industry. Dum, dum, dum. Look out. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, okay, so to demonstrate today, I'm going to, last time two weeks ago, we had a three item GRE that I used just to try to get some quick model to fit. And with three items, the CFA measurement model where we estimate everything is perfectly fitting. So I thought, that, check, I can do that quick. So I'm going to use those three items again. Remember the GRI, uh, GRE, I think I said before, GRI, Gambling Research Instrument. This is supposed to be measuring gambling. There are 41 items. I'm picking three items out of it. That'll be our example today. The three items ranged uh, were all liquor type items where the lowest score for each one was a 1 and the highest score was a 6. That means a person's score could range between 3 to 18 in one-point units, right? A 3 you would have. Uh, if you if you said I strongly disagree with every one of these items, and a 18 would be if you strongly agree with every one of these items. I'm not showing the items. I could, but let's just this is just trying to make it fit for every score that you could do this with. Does this seem like a setup familiar to you? You're taking class on this right now. Is that right? Is it the classical test theory course you're in? I am going to boldly say that at the end of this class, in three slides. I will do what a lot of months of class and classical test theory should have. No, I'm just kidding. We'll see. I'll have some take on that too. So anyway, here's our sum score. Look at that distribution. What does that mean? Most people strongly disagree with anything to do with gambling. I've seen that before. So, so the use of a sum score brings about a discussion about the psychometrics that underlie sum scores. And maybe I should have those of you in... Which one is it? 921. 921 come up here and describe what we're assuming in psychometrics. Uh, classical test theory. What you've learned about in measurement so far likely falls into the category of classical test theory with the exception of CFA. And if you've taken item response theory, that's also true. Um, and that involves writing and building scales, item analysis, score interpretation, and evaluating reliability and construct validity. How many of you just love discussions of reliability? It's just like the best, isn't it? Yeah, We're going to have one of those. Anyway, um, so the big picture is what we're going to do is view classical test theory as a model. It's actually debatable. Some people don't like the idea of putting the word model by classical test theory, but I believe it is actually a statistical model. And when we get into the world of statistical models, just like we've done in class, we do model comparisons, right? Classical test theory, we can show is a statistical model with a very restrictive set of assumptions and parameter constraints. We can phrase a CFA model as a classical test theory model, and then we can test to see if it's true. We can reject whether classical test theory would hold. And believe it or not, more often, almost always, I was talking about this with my wife, who teaches a class on this topic or used to teach a class on this topic. I don't know if she will uh, when she resumes teaching next semester. Uh, and then time to come. But um, she was saying, yeah, I have my students as one of my homeworks do this, test classical test theory and uh, with their own data. And she said, I think there was one time in my, I don't know, five times of teaching this course, five semesters of teaching it, that I found one data set where it fit. All right. How about that? That class you all are taking, 921, it never works. You could do without it. So, anyway, pardon me. Megan's looking down. Did I just insult? You just insulted a class. I'm sorry. It may be a really good class, but it's great. Fairy Tale Town's the best park of Disneyland, right? No, sorry. What was that? What was that, Mr. Bain? That's good. I'm not trying to insult the instructor there. I like Billy quite a bit. As you know, I love Billy. I'm talking more about a big picture. Big picture. Uh, when I interviewed here, some people said bromance between the two of us, or pro, what was it? Professors, I think they called us. 
It's like you had a little professor going with you there. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I like Billy. It's not about Billy. It's more about, uh, I try to think critically about how we teach you all because there's a huge disconnect between what we're teaching and what actually is known statistically. And I'm trying to figure out where that happens to fall. And I think it's because we do curricula that are stuck on things from the 1910, 1910 era. Anyway, sorry. What is the name of a latent trait measured by a test? If you're in classical test theory, we use the word true score there. We're looking for a true score, right? Is that what they said? I don't know. Here's the dirty secret about classical test theory. I never took a class on it. Sorry. Because it was subsumed into this model right here. Um, classical test theory, there's a true score out there. In CFA, we call it a factor score. And every time I say that, I hear that somebody on my, somebody, some caricature of all my previous colleagues in different departments saying, you can't use those. Right. Uh, and then theta. And all of a sudden, theta, for me, for whatever reason, is, is much more pure than the factor score. But I'm going to show you today they're the same thing, actually. But. So the fundamental difference between all these mechanisms, particularly the first, classical test theory, where we add things up, and the other two, is the unit of analysis. In classical test theory, your unit of analysis is the whole test. It's the sum of the items, sometimes the mean. Right? So the sum, then, is your best estimate of a person's latent trait. That's your best estimate of their true test score. Right? Using the sum, though, does require restrictive assumptions about the items. What are some of the assumptions we make about the items in a, in, in, to add them together? <clears throat> All, equally important. All equally important. Right? That's it. Any item can do. Item one versus item three, whatever. How do you make reliability higher? More. What type? More. <laughs> I don't care. So long as it's an item and I can put it on the form, more. <laughs> it's true. It, it is tough. And I will say this. A lot of that's true for CFA, too, because there is uh, ways of tricking it out to make it better, too, or IRT for that matter as well. So that's classical test theory. It's about the unit of the test. CFA, IRT, and beyond, the unit of the analysis is the item. I put beyond there, by the way, because quickly what we're going to talk about is the thing I started the class with, with the idea of distributions that run the world. Each of these measurement models is implying different distributions for the items, different distributions for the factor. Right? So any combination of distribution for item and factor produces a measurement model. Only two of them have names that I know of. Right? So we're going to keep that in mind, too. Right? CFA... IRT, what happens if you want to do factor analysis of count data? Is that Poisson factor analysis or Poisson response theory? I mean, like, there's no way of talking about it, but it still fits under the same framework, right? So the unit of the analysis of the item, we want the data, just the data, pure and simple, right? Uh, how the item response relates to an estimate. The, is, the model of how an item response relates to this estimated latent trait, the factor or theta. And so essentially, once we have the item response, we provide this model that looks like a regression function. We pretend we observed the factor, although we didn't, and said, had we observed it, what would it look like in this regression model? Plug it in, make it work, right? Uh, there are different models for different item response formats, right? So CFA is when we have items that we think are normally distributed, which is tenuous at best, and actually that is a, a contention, and you're going to see that in the slide coming up, that is one of the problems with the factor score is that we have error because of that assumption. Uh, IRT, item response theory, is essentially CFA, but when our data are now category categorical items. Either they are multinomial, so you've got a greater response, a partial credit, a nominal response, or something along those lines, or you have items that are binary, um, which is actually subsumed into multinomial if you want to think about it. So, um, and again, what I was mentioning before, if you have count data, you can change the distribution now. It's not multinomial. It's categorical, but there may be an upper endpoint that is out to infinity. We call that Poisson, or maybe a zero inflated Poisson, or there's all sorts of names out there. Negative binomial. Stop me if you've heard any of these before. Cauchy. Oh my goodness, I have a Cauchy factor model. We could do it, right? Pick, pick one. I mean, pick a new one. Define your own. There's an infinite number of distributions. Any of them can go into this is what I'm talking about. But the framework of the measurement models with items provides a nice 
framework for testing the adequacy of the assumptions of the model. Right, back before we knew all this, we added things up. We didn't quite discover what happened when we added things up. We started becoming aware of that in 1904, and since then it's been a long progression. I would say 1904. That's the, 19, the year that uh, Spearman had two papers that came out. I don't know if I've mentioned those before. So here is classical test theory in a nutshell. Your total score on a test is thought to represent the con contribution of what your true score would happen to be, T, plus some error, measurement error itself. Right? So it looks like a regression. Y equals T plus E. The true score is your best estimate of latent traits. So when you're adding things together, you're trying to get at T. Right? That's it. There's one. There's a T. You're going to add things together because there's one, one T underlying it. But, but with every type of score or with every type of test that we give, there's error involved in it. And who knows where error can come from? It could come from all sorts of places. I'm going to have a, what I think is a fairly complete list, although I'm not sure it's complete complete, in a few slides about what error is in a score. But, um, uh-oh, did I do something wrong? I see people laughing. I'm self-conscious. Oh, oh, did I do something wrong? Anyway. anyway, so error shows up. What we like to assume is that error has a, a mean of zero, which means uh, the expected value of your of your test score is the true score. So if you were to give everybody a test and then wipe their mind clean, that they make them actually test them while they're on like propofol, you know what I'm talking about? I have to make this joke often if you, you know what I'm talking about. Or the men in black wand, you know, where like you forget what you just did. Like you give them a test and, and like flash the memory and then whatever. You know, you know, like the stuff that they give you when you go get your wisdom teeth out, propofol or Versed or something like that, where you have no short-term memory encoding? Give them a test on that. Like Michael Jackson OD'd on propofol, right? So it's, anyway, yeah, crazy, right? Um, if we did this repeatedly, what we would expect to find is that over the long run, the average of the total scores represented the true score, right? You've heard this before? Sweet, right? So, um, so we haven't made any distributional assumptions yet. But even if your data do fit a one-factor model, when using the sum score itself, right, when you use this total score, even if all this is true, even if this is right, when you use this total score, error shows up in it, right? You can't really disentangle error in a total score. You've added things up. You can't take it out. It's there. It's back. You may assume this is the case, but then you're like, oh, okay, that's fine, it's error. Right? <coughs> so anyway, it's, um, it's only one part of the error in the score. And so what I'm building this lecture to be is that the sum score itself is related to these other measurement models. And once we make that relationship, then all the things that can show up that we have to assume in the other measurement models come back and haunt us in the score as well, too. So there. So here's more classical test theory. Uh, a goal of classical test theory is to quantify reliability. You'll notice I've conspicuously absent, not talked about reliability yet in this course. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to give you one formula with SEM, with the CFA model parameters that you can do all reliability that you'll ever need to know for if you're doing CFA. Okay? Uh, that includes coefficient alpha, Spearman Brown. It's all in there. All one. Just one formula. Pretty good deal, right? Anyway. We want to quantify reliability. Uh, the way we do that is to, to take a look at our function and we use, this is the math side of it. If you're familiar with, uh, what we're trying to do is quantify the variance of the total score. And using mathematical statistics, a variance is a version of an expected value. So here's an expected value. Uh, the, the expected value is just what happens over the long run, weighting a, fun a parameter by the likelihood of a di from a distribution. Um, but there are certain algebra that goes with it. So this is me shortening the algebra. The variance of the total score is equal to the variance. You can sub out the total score for the model. And so when we do that, we get the variance of T plus the variance of E plus two times the, two, the covariance of the of true score plus error. But because the, the covariance is zero, because they're independent or assumed to be independent, what we're really left with is the, total, the variance of the total score comes from a sum of the variance of true score plus variance of error. So therefore, reliability is quantified almost always as the proportion of variation in the total score that is due to variation in the true score. 
right? Variance of true score over variance of the total score itself. So variance of y, once again, that's, that's the variance of observations. That histogram I put up of all the sum scores that you just saw, that's like this, the whole range, so we can quantify variation with it. The, two, the true score itself, variance of t, that's something that's unobserved. But a lot of times we call that individual differences, right? So if we had no measurement error whatsoever, all the variation in our sum score would come from people being different. That's it. That's what we really want to have. We want to have, like, if we had a ruler, charged word. Remember the word ruler, right? If we, our rulers are fairly accurate, right? Measurement error is close to zero. I mean, we could, depending on where the line markings are and whatnot. But let's imagine we have a ruler, trivial measurement error. If I measured all your heights in here, right? Your heights would be like my observed data, right? The, there'd be variation in your heights. That variation, because the ruler is accurate and height is a construct we can easily quantify, that variation is all due to your true height, right? That's it. There's no error to it. It's just variation because of it, the height itself. But in psychometrics, we can't measure a construct just like height. So therefore, we have things called measurement error. And a person's score, because it's made up of like their true score plus error, variation can come from measurement error as well. So if all we had was measurement error, we didn't have true score, we'd just have just random noise of test scores. It wouldn't relate to a person's whatever quantity that you're trying to get at. So that is the, the, the how do we get it in a nutshell. And we spend a lot of time, in, in, help me out here, in your classical test theory class, so you spend a lot of time quantifying reliability. Did you do that at the beginning? Right? Because we, we've observed one test score, but we've got to figure out these two entities that come from it. And these words like split half and blah, blah, blah. Forget them. Forget them. It doesn't matter. Those don't need it anymore. We'll quantify reliability better in just a moment. All right? We can do so with a better model. Uh, and I'll, you'll see that in just a bit. So draw, Templin, draw. All right. Uh, what I was drawing here was this is Y. This is your test score. Right, and so what we what we will have here for a given person, any given person, right? If this is maybe this is zero, and this is capital I for items, any given person may be right here, but this is based on this is what their estimate of true their true score may be here, but their their actual test score may be somewhere in a distribution around the, the true score. So it may be here or maybe here. Same with a person down here; they have a distribution as well. So once you get an observation from each person, you get this overall kind of variation in Y, but some of it's due to person and some of our individual characteristics, and some of it's just random noise itself. How am I doing on the classical test there? Did I say anything wrong? Stop me. I'm looking at you all because you're like the, the, the newest trainees in a methodology that's like, you know, stuff that happened before we had really good roads that automobiles rode on. There was a streetcar that started in Lawrence the year that the first versions of reliability that we used still come out, came out. And you're still learning about it. The streetcar is long gone, though. Sorry. Anyway. So that brings up another part point. Have any of you heard of a uh, parcel before? Not like parcel post. Maybe a parcel post. What's parcel mean Like in the English language definition? Absolutely. Bundle. Oh, I could. Do I have Google up? Okay, Google. Define parcel. Parcel, a thing or collection of things wrapped in paper in order to be carried or sent by mail. Psychometricians or people who are who claim to be psychometricians have hijacked the word parcel. And what they do is essentially say, okay, um, yeah, I have a bunch of items. Uh, I could put it in a big measurement model. But I'm going to take some of these items or some of these scores and add them together first. And then I'm going to take that sum and put that sum into a measurement model. Right? That is a parcel, that sum of things. And so the parceling folks out there um, are interesting because it's like, okay, you're doing a sum. So when I think sum, I think classical test theory. I think classical tr true score theory. It's just it evoked. It's trained. It's hardwired into me now. Rod McDonald was the person who really started me on this path, right? For my first year semester of class in his test theory book. Anyway, this 
true score uh, approach um, sounds good. I went to talk to somebody who was who gave a presentation at one of our. I'm part of an exclusive conference, Society of Multivariate Experimental Psychology. I say that because it's such a joke. There are only 65 active members, and I got elected this year. And so at my first one meeting where I could sit, you all, the 65 of them sit at this table in the round, and if you're not one of them, you can't sit at the table. <laughs> it's such a joke. We're being recorded at this. It's so annoying, right? <laughs> so I, um, they don't know this, but I'm there to destroy it. So you've got to destroy it from the inside, right? But um, the, uh, not, the, not the, the society, I just want to make it more inclusive. Right. Anyway, person gives a talk on parceling. I go up to this person. I respect her quite a bit. I like her. She's a good scientist. I say, hey, isn't a parcel you know, trying to get a true score? No, I don't. It was like I was from a different planet. I think I said this story. It was like a different planet. Her and her grad student were so offended that I suggested that it might be this. So I've been racking my brain trying to see her point of view. I'm trying to think, okay, so if it's not this, this true score plus error, why don't we just go with this? It's just some variance. Okay, it's a sum of things. So that sum of things really is a random variable itself. You can't parcel out, <laughs> you can't disentangle, pardon my language, um, any type of variation, but what you've done when you add things together is take the variation and throw it out the window. Right? So parceling is another form of class, uh, or classical test theory. You can, you can make this assumption. If you make this classical test theory assumption, at least what you're saying is, I've got a score that I know is at least partially has variation on the after, rather than something that doesn't, right? But that's fine. So parceling, again, fits under this whole ballpark because we're taking variation, I'm going to call it error. That's an empty model right there, right? Remember the empty model? The empty model is something where you uh, get an estimate of a variable's total variation. That is what I'm taking this person's uh, statement to mean when they didn't want to assume classical test theory. They couldn't make an assumption, so, so therefore you had just have variation, a random variable that's a sum of other ones. Anyway, so either way, what we're saying about classical test theory scores applies to item parcels as well. And it's the systematic way of taking error and hiding it, or throwing it away. That, that is bad because it, will in, it, it has ramifications that go beyond what we do. Uh, of course, I'm bad because really parceling is if you see a certain segment of people in the field in the quant methods field mainly quant psychology do it they are almost open about it to say well what we're doing is hiding where degrees of freedom are where our model misfit is bad All right so i have these three items yeah i see bad you know you know high correlate high you know residual covariances or normalized residuals. I don't know what to do with them. I'm just going to add three of them together. Boom, the problem goes away. Add three of them together, now the model fits. I call it good, right? right? And it especially works out because if the model fits, then I get to add everything together anyway. Right? Because the, 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 the thing I put in the quotes from before. So to me, parceling is cheating. If you're parcel, think snake oil sells. That's how I think, right? Like, oh, wait a minute, that's a problem. But uh, uh, I'd like to not just say it's cheating, I'd like to prove to you, or show you, but it's mathematical, proof that it is. So, what happens when you put a test, with test score together? What are the sources of error that show up in the test score? Here is my list. There's what I'm trying to come about getting, and I'm trying to do this by every type of method I talk about for whenever you take a result from a test and do something with it. I want to take this list, revisit it, and see what we can line out. First thing that we have is measurement error. That's clear because it's part of our model, right? A, E. So when you add things up, measurement error comes back. It's there. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, but what isn't really talked about is that we may have model misspecification error. And I say that's not talked about. I mean, if you look at the, the I give you chapters from the Rakoff and Markolides book. Uh, Tenko Rakoff, I like, the per, I like him very much uh, also, but he has a nice perspective that he doesn't, I believe it may even be written in the book, which is that classical test theory isn't a, doesn't assume a model at all. And when you say you don't assume a model, then you start to not ignore all the other things that models might bring about. But models are harder, but they're definitely more, to me, they're more clear. That, I mean, they can they enumerate what could possibly go wrong. <coughs> and, and, and it's nice to know that so that you know whenever you don't use a model or whenever you put certain assumptions in a model, you can tell 
explicitly, I've assumed this and this and this to make this work. And then you can say, well, is that really reasonable to do so? Anyway, so what are the model errors we have? Right, so I, I thought that when I was making this lecture, I was actually bouncing this off of Lisa, my wife. Um, we talk about this while we're feeding the child and changing his diaper. Right? I'm going to have, uh, actually one of Lisa's colleagues in uh, the, the Lifespan Institute, a uh, person named Candace. She had her PhD from our program, uh, the REMS program here. I like her very much. She had shirts made for Huey, and one of them was a chi square tops. And it was uh, a picture of a, of a dinosaur, and it had this, this, it was in a distribution like this. All right, so, so Hugh is going to be well aware of these things. I know I need to break in just a bit. Let me get through this real quick, though. Uh, model misspecification error brings up, and there are different types of it, right? We could guess wrong on the dimensionality. When you're adding things up, it could be that you really should be adding things up and breaking them into two separate areas, not one. If you get that wrong, guess what? Error. Uh, there are parameter constraint misspecification errors. Like, what is that? What's a parameter constraint? Setting a parameter equal to a, Z, a value or another parameter. Right? It's the thing in parentheses in Levon. Right? Classical test theory is doing this. To add things up, you make a bunch of constraints, call it good. <coughs> so this is present when you're adding things up, most certainly. Uh, these other ones are harder to define. Linear model functional misspecification. Right? If there's not a if there's a nonlinear relationship between the trait and the item, right? So maybe it's curvilinear. Maybe it's not just. It's almost like what you'd have is you have the quadratic regression, but you put a linear version into it. Uh, the distribution of the outcome. Uh, if your data aren't quite normal or whatever else, this is a problem. Although uh, it's more of a question mark here for CTT. And then finally, the factor distribution itself. This is more of an issue later on as well. And finally, uh, another big part of error comes from missing data. What do you do with your missing responses when you add things together? Now, if somebody didn't answer one of your survey questions, what do you do with them? In 921, what do you do with them? Is that what they say? Just drop it? They didn't answer it at all? Anybody work with surveys? Multiple imputation. Multiple imputation. That's good. Can do that. It's better. I would say that. Multiple imputation would get rid of this, but a lot of times what people do sometimes average. Take the average instead of the total score. Right? Then a person's average, if they have a 10 item test and they missed one, didn't answer one of the items, now they'd be out of, out of nine. So. Anyway, if that, that also becomes more assumption fit. But I'll tell you one thing you don't have under this approach, which is nice. You don't have sampling error. It's like, what? So when you get into models, you get into estimation. We have to estimate model parameters. Each of those depends on sample size. And the smaller sample you have, the more variability there are around each of those parameters. Those factor loadings, those unique variances. In IRT, the A, the B, whatever. And so if you have sampling error, you're going to see that that's, we're going to show up later on. All right, so why it matters, um, this is my, well, I'm going to stop here. Let's take a break for 10 minutes, and I'll get back to you.